Welcome to our Sunday School lesson for Sunday, May 17th, 2020. I'm Fred Jeff Smith, pastor of Shiloh Missionary Baptist Church. I'm very happy that you chose to spend part of your time with us today. Our lesson today comes from Jeremiah chapter 21, verses 8 through 14. We're still dealing with the general theme of God's justice. And today's lesson is entitled, Just Rewards. Again, Jeremiah chapter 21, verses 8 through 14. Let me share with you uh, the reading of the scripture. And then tell the people at large, God's message to you is this. Listen carefully. I'm giving you a choice, life or death. Whoever stays in this city will die, either in battle or by starvation or disease. But whoever goes out and surrenders to the Chaldeans who have surrounded the city will live. You'll lose everything, but not your life. I'm determined to see this city destroyed. I'm that angry with this place, God's decree. I'm going to give it to the king of Babylon, and he's going to burn it to the ground. To the royal house of Judah, listen to God's message. House of David, listen. God's message to you. Start each day by dealing with justice. Rescue victims from their exploiters. Prevent fire, the fire of my anger. For once it starts, it can't be put out. Your evil regime is fuel for my anger. Don't you realize that I'm against you? Yes, against you. You think you've got it made, all snug and secure. You say, who can possibly get to us? Who can crash our party? Well, I can and will. I'll punish your evil regime. I'll start a fire that will rage unchecked, burn everything in sight to cinders. All right, the lesson is prophetic and it is pragmatic. And what the lesson essentially says is that when God is against you, there's nothing you can do about it. And that's what God is saying to the people of Judah and in particular to the king of Judah at this time, a man by the name of Zedekiah. Uh, this word from Jeremiah, of course, was not a very popular word, but it was a word that the prophet had to give nonetheless. One of the things uh, that I like to say about Jeremiah is that Jeremiah gave a very unpopular message at a very unpopular time to people who were resistant to the word of God. Consequently, his ministry is marked by sadness. Jeremiah is commonly called the weeping prophet because he spends much of his time uh, in lament over the people of Judah and their sin. And yet, lament is the word from the Lord. I know particularly in times like these, people want to hear a, a helpful word from God. They want to hear a happy word from God. I always want to hear a happy word from God. I'm, I'm no different from anybody else. But the truth of the matter is not every word from God is a happy word. Sometimes what God has to say to us is troubling and troublesome. And that's the case with this text. Jeremiah chapters 21 through 24 comprise the second major division of this book. It's generally agreed by scholars that the date of the writing was near the onset of Nebuchadnezzar's final siege of Jerusalem, the holy city of God, which took place between 588 and 586 B.C. There's a 20-year gap between Jeremiah chapter 20 and Jeremiah chapter 21. You don't get that immediately from the text. But there is a 20-year gap between uh, these two chapters. And a great deal happened in that 20-year span of time. First of all, Jehoiakim, 
a protege of Egypt came to the throne of Judah and reigned for 11 years, wavering between the necessity of paying tribute to Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, and rebelling against Nebuchadnezzar. Sometimes he would act like he was Nebuchadnezzar's ally, and sometimes he would act as though he were Nebuchadnezzar's opponent. And when he did that, when, when he tried to oppose Nebuchadnezzar, it was contrary to Jeremiah's advice. Jeremiah's primary message was God has already decided what's going to happen. God has already decreed that Jerusalem and Judah, Jerusalem the city, Judah the nation, was going to fall uh, to the Babylonian Empire. Uh, and they were going to be punished for their sin, primarily the sin of idolatry. And so Jeremiah's word was one of appeasement, one of compromise. Get the best that you can out of this situation. Make the most that you can out of this situation because it's going to be a protracted period of judgment. Sometimes Jehoiakim listened and he allied himself with Nebuchadnezzar. Often, however, he tried to oppose Nebuchadnezzar, and it would be like a fly trying to oppose an elephant. He was much too small, much too weak to offer any real resistance. After his death, Jehoiakim came to the throne for a brief three-month period of time. But that three-month reign ended ingloriously when he ended up surrendering the city to Nebuchadnezzar in 597. BC. In fact, there's a date attached to it, the 9th of Adar of 597 BC. Why was his reign so short? Because he tried to oppose Nebuchadnezzar and he didn't have the strength to do it. And he found himself uh, destroyed in the process. And it was rather brutal destruction that took place. Nebuchadnezzar had finally defeated Egypt and he had carried Jehoiakim uh, to Babylon along with many of the captive nobility. This is where Daniel and Daniel's companions, the people that we know as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, this is when they found themselves in Babylonian captivity. And at the same time, Nebuchadnezzar placed Zedekiah a king of his own choice on the throne of Israel. Zedekiah was there to be loyal to Nebuchadnezzar. He had sworn his perpetual loyalty to the king of Babylon, but he defaulted on his promises and he did evil in the sight of God. Eleven years after coming to the throne, Zedekiah rebelled and he tried to overthrow Nebuchadnezzar's power within Jerusalem. Nebuchadnezzar responded by moving to destroy Jerusalem. He mopped up the cities surrounding Jerusalem, and then he began a siege on the city. And the siege lasted for a three-year period of time. A siege was a particularly brutal way of destroying a people. Uh, when, 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 when a city was besieged, what it literally meant was that you were surrounded. You were surrounded by the enemy invaders, but they did not invade, at least not immediately. They would simply cut off your supplies. You were cut off to supplies of food. You were cut off to supplies of water, and you were forced to stay within the walls of the city. And what happens when you stay within the walls of the city for a protracted period of time? There was no modern day sanitation available to these people, which meant that people were forced uh, to drink from the same uh, wells that animals were forced to drink from. And that meant that the wells became polluted. It, mean, it meant that the animals soon died because the water supplies eventually ran out. There was pestilence. There was no place to take. People weren't buried within the city. Usually when death took place, the bodies or the carcasses, whatever the case may be, were carried out of the city and buried somewhere else. But because the city was besieged, you could not go outside the city gates, which meant that carcasses and dead bodies remained in the city, which meant that disease 
cropped up within the city, and it soon became rampant throughout the city. You and I are dealing right now with a pandemic that has spread across this nation. Well, imagine a more localized pandemic. You're within the walls of a city, and even though Jerusalem was a rather large city, able to accommodate hundreds of thousands of people, it was still a walled-in city with disease spreading throughout the city. The people became weak, food supplies became short, water supplies became non-existent, disease raged throughout the people. And the besieging went on not for a few weeks, not for a few months, but it went on for a three-year period of time to the point that the people were so weak that they could not even mount an adequate defense. And it was only after this three-year period of time that Nebuchadnezzar and uh, the enemy's uh, soldiers of Babylon invaded the city, overran it, and the destruction was absolute. Every stone of the city was torn from the other so that there was nothing left of the city. This was the kind of attack that Nebuchadnezzar placed upon the city of Jerusalem. But what we're reading, what, what our text deals with is what will happen as it's happening. We're not getting the tail end of it. We're getting the beginnings of this besieging during the reign of Zedekiah. And it is in response to his attempts to overthrow Nebuchadnezzar as uh, the ruler, the, the, the occupying force of Judah and Jerusalem. As I said, our lesson uh, comes from uh, Jeremiah chapter 21, beginning with verse 8. But it's important that we read the verses that come before that because our lesson begins with a conjunctive. It begins, and then tell the people. And since there's a conjunction, it makes sense that you read what came before it in order to get a proper context for what comes after it. So I invite you to turn to Jeremiah chapter 21, beginning with verse 1. God's message to Jeremiah when King Zedekiah sent Pasha, son of Malchiah, and the priest Zephaniah, son of Messiah, to him with this request. Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, has waged war against us. Pray to God for us. Ask him for help. Maybe God will intervene with one of his famous miracles and make him leave. But Jeremiah said, tell Zedekiah, this is the God of Israel's message to you. You can say goodbye to your army. Watch morale and weapons flush down the drain. I'm going to personally lead the king of Babylon and the Chaldeans against whom you're fighting so hard right into the city itself. I'm joining their side and fighting against you, fighting all out, holding nothing back. And in fierce anger, I'm prepared to wipe out the population of this city, people and animals alike, in a raging epidemic, which is what I was describing. And then I will personally deliver Zedekiah, king of Judah, his princes, and any survivors left in the city who haven't died from disease, been killed, are starved. I'll deliver them to Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. Yes, hand them over to their enemies, to who have come to kill them. He'll kill them ruthlessly, showing no mercy. That's verses 1 through 7, leading up to our printed lesson, which begins in verse 8, which starts with, and then tell the people at large. Okay? So, it's important that you get what came before so that you have an understanding of what came after. After Zedekiah decided that he was going to try to wage war against Nebuchadnezzar, outmanned, out weaponed, and yet he was going to try to rage war against Nebuchadnezzar. Nobody can possibly know what he was thinking that made him think that he could possibly win. And he realized that he was not going to win, that he had awakened a giant in his midst. After he did these things, without the consent of God, then he goes to the prophet and he says, pray to God on our behalf and perhaps God will intervene with a miracle. Is this not the nature of humanity? Has this not always been our way? We do what we want. We get ourselves in trouble, and then and only then do we turn to God and ask for help. 
Wouldn't it be so much better if we tried to stay within the will of God before we do foolish things, before we act in which I'm as guilty of this as anybody else. I, I, I see something and sometimes without thinking, I react to what I see rather than thoughtfully plan out a response to what I see. And, and sometimes the reaction is a poor one. Uh, and, 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 and then what you try to do is mitigate uh, the damage that is to result. And you, you go to God and you say, God, please forgive me for, for what I did. How about don't do it? There's a thought. H how about don't do it? How about talk to God before you act? How about listen? It wasn't like Zedekiah had not been warned. It wasn't like he had not been told beforehand. This is what God has said he's going to do. You need to line yourself up with God's will. It may not be what you want, but it's God's will. And you need to learn how to line up with what God's will is. We were talking just uh, the other day in Bible study about prayer. We're, we're doing a Bible study uh, from 1 Timothy. And in 1 Timothy chapter 2, uh, Paul uh, encourages Timothy to make prayer uh, a vital part of the worship experience of the church that he pastors in Ephesus. One of the values of prayer is it helps us to line up our will with God's will. Understand, I did not say it helps us to get God to line up his will with ours, which is what many of us think prayer is, getting from God what we want. No, prayer's purpose is to help us to align ourselves with God's will. And once you know what God's will is, it is important that you align yourself with it or else you find yourself in opposition, not just to human entities, not just to human circumstances, but you find yourself lined up in opposition to God. And that's the last place that you want to be. So much of, of, of the problem that we face uh, today in America uh, is due to the fact that we have decided what we want to do. And then after we've done it and we've seen the damaging effects of it, we go to God and we try to ask God to fix what we have broken. Now, am I suggesting that God can't fix what we've broken? No, not at all. Am I suggesting that God doesn't fix what we've broken? More often than not, he does. But when God tells you this is going to be, the best thing that you can do is line up with God's will. Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane had a will, but he knew that his will was contrary to God's will, and he knew that God's will must be done. He felt the need to tell God what he wanted. Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Now, as he's praying that, Jesus knew that it wasn't possible, but he felt the need to express it anyway. But he ended the prayer by saying, not my will, but your will be done. That's where all of us have to be in prayer. We have to be in a place where we recognize that it's not about us having our way. It's about us lining up our will with what God's way is going to be. Zedekiah decided he was going to fight against Nebuchadnezzar. And He's, he knew that he had bitten off more than he could chew. And faced with the, the, the disaster that was in front of him and filled with fear that rocked him from head to toe, he decides, maybe now I should talk to God. Maybe now I should talk to God's prophet. Maybe now I should list God's prophet's support in what I am doing. And so he sent word to Jeremiah asking Jeremiah to pray to God so that God would intervene with one of the miracles that he was known for doing. Jeremiah says, ain't going to happen, buddy. Sorry. You, 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 you ought to look on that one. God has decreed that this is going to happen and you 
should have gotten yourself within the will of God. So the first seven verses of this 22nd, of, of this 21st chapter of Jeremiah are devoted to Jeremiah's rebuke on God's behalf of the king. And our lesson picks up with verse eight and it says, and then tell the people at large. And so it's important that you saw what came before. Zedekiah, you're going to be destroyed. Now, let me tell the people about them. And he offers to the people a choice. With Zedekiah, there is no choice. I, I, I want you to hear it again. He, he says, uh, Jer tell Zedekiah, this is God of Israel's message to you. You can say goodbye to your army, watch morale and weapons flush down the drain. I'm going to personally lead the king of Babylon and the Chaldeans against whom you're fighting so hard right into the city itself. I'm joining their side and fighting against you. If God is fighting against you, you're in trouble. So for Zedekiah, there is no option. There is no alternative. But for the people, God offers an option. Then tell the people at large, God's message to you is this. Listen carefully. I'm giving you a choice, life or death. Whoever stays in this city will die, either in battle or by starvation or disease. But whoever goes out and surrenders to the Chaldeans who have surrounded the city, you will live. Now, in that he offers you an option, he's saying that what has happened to the leadership is already written. It's already been decided. It's already been decreed. But you have a choice. You can either live or die. God has declared what he's going to do. The only question that's left is how will you Respond, And the consequences are directly tied to your response. Here's the message for us regarding the ultimate decision of life, because you don't really care about the history lesson of what went on in ancient Judah. You, you, you want to know how does this relate to me and my everyday life regarding the ultimate decision of life, which is whether to accept or reject God's salvation through Jesus. The same matter of fact reality prevails. God has declared that salvation is available, but it's available only through Jesus. And so the question for us is not can we be saved, but will we be saved? And will we be saved? The answer to that question is entirely up to you. It's entirely under your control. Here's, here, here's what you can't do. You can't be saved any other way. Scripture says there's one name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. And that name is the name of Jesus. Jesus says of himself, God so of the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes on him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And that's usually where we stop. Verse 16, you need to read verse 17. God also said that if you don't believe on him, you are condemned already because you have rejected his only son. You have rejected the only means of salvation. But what that tells us is that the choice is ours. How do you respond to that choice? Here's what you can't do. You can't make up another means of salvation. You can't say, well, I want to be saved, but I don't want to be saved through Jesus. I, I, I don't want to surrender to him. I don't want to submit to him. I want to find another way to serve. Aren't there many other ways to God? No. No, there are not. There's one way to get to God's salvation, and that's through Jesus Christ. And so God offers the people a choice. You can stay in the city and you can die, or you can come out of the city and you can leave. And he doesn't mince words about it. He, he, he doesn't pretend like it's going to be better. He says, you're going to lose everything, but you're not going to lose your life. Sometimes that's the... That, that, that's the choice that you have to make. Sometimes that's the priority that you have to look at. Some, some people are trying to hold on to stuff and hold on to God at the same time. And God is saying, can't do that. 
If you're going to come to me, some stuff you're going to have to let go. If anyone would come after me, what, what stuff are you talking about? If anyone would come after me, you must deny self, which means you got you, you to gotta put you in the back. You, you got to let go of you. Take up your cross, which means that you have to embrace suffering, which means that you have to let go of this idea of a life of ease and comfort. And follow me. You have to let go of your free will where you say, I can go anywhere I want to go and do whatever I want to do. And you have to be committed to following the path that God has set through Jesus Christ. You have to lose everything, God says to the people, but you will save your life. The choice is yours. To the royal house of Judah, listen to God's message. House of David, listen, God's message to you. Start each day by dealing with justice. Rescue victims from their exploiters. Prevent fire, the fire of my anger. For once it starts, it can't be put out. Your evil regime is fuel for my anger. Don't you realize that I'm against you? Yes, against you. You think you've got it made, all snug and secure. You say, who can possibly get to us? Who can crash our party? Well, I can. I love Peterson. I love the way the message version puts things. I can, and I will. I'll punish your evil regime. I will start a fire that will rage unchecked, burn everything in sight to Senders. Now, what's important here is that after he offers the ultimatum to the house of, of not, not to the leadership of Judah, to the people of Judah, to the people of Jerusalem, he goes back and addresses the house of Judah a second time. Remember, the chapter opens. We read the part that's not in your printed lesson. It opens with a word to the king, and the, 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 the rest of the chapter deals with the king. And he says to the king, again, you need to change your ways. In spite of all that's happened, you need to change your ways. And what you need to do is start dealing with people in a just manner. You need to recognize what justice looks like. And he gives us a description of what justice looks like. Rescue victims from their exploiters. Is that not the very definition of life today? Marginalized people are victims of exploitation. And, 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 and it is our responsibility to first be observant of this exploitation and then to speak out against the exploitation and where we can to move against the exploitation. If we are truly about justice, God's justice, if we are truly about equity in the world, then we have to make ourselves committees of one, singular committees of individuals who will stand up and speak out against injustice wherever we find it. And, and, and the prophet says on God's behalf, that the reason why you're going to be destroyed is because you haven't done the things that you were assigned to do. For our benefit, it's very appropriate at this point in our nation's history that we be reminded that there is a direct relationship between corrupt leadership and corrupt people. Even in America, where there is supposed to be separation of church and state, our leadership should rise to some level of moral and ethical accountability, providing an appropriate example to our people and to people around the world. To fail in this responsibility causes terrible consequences. Jeremiah's message to Zedekiah was discomforting. Not only is God going to allow Babylon to assemble right there in the middle of the city, but God is going to hand Jerusalem, Judah, and King Zedekiah to the invading armies. Zedekiah will be destroyed, but the people will have an opportunity to survive. The, the, the final thing that I want to say to you is remember that God always gives us a choice is the way of life or the way 
of death. Zedekiah's choice was confirmed in the previous chapters. He had been warned of the dangers of the choices that he was making, but he persisted in going his own way. And in this lesson, we see what happened when he went his own way. But we also see that God has offered us a choice. And the question for us is, what will we do with the choice that God has given to us? We can either choose to live according to his standards, according to his principles, according to his righteousness, or we can choose to die. God bless you. Have a great day.